Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Ben Lockwin and Scott Endicott for another episode. Gentlemen, first of all, welcome back. Thank you, Tom. Great to be Jensen, back. Jensen, this episode, I wanted to maybe look at some questions around navigating the new world of personalized medicine with cell and gene therapies. I have to say this is a little bit out of my typical area of expertise. How would you like to open this topic and move forward from there? We got you covered here. Uh, I'll jump in first and just say personalized medicine is where we should start. Let's define it. Personalized medicine, I would call those medical therapies that are designed specifically for each individual patient to whom they'll be administered. As an example, I'm trying to think of a good one here. This, there's something called CYP450. So there's an enzyme and these enzymes in our bodies are hemoproteins that play a role in detoxifying biotics. They work on cellular metabolism, homeostasis. And essentially, an example of a personalized therapy is correct personalized dosing of warfarin. So th this is done based on a patient's CYP450 profile. So this is done with a blood draw. And the data seem to suggest that doing personalized medicine dosing of warfarin could prevent 17,000 strokes in the United States annually and avoid 43,000 emergency room visits, just as an example. So those are pretty staggering numbers to be sure. And advances like that in, in personalized medicine only need to move a little bit further along the continuum from where they currently are, because that exists as a type of personalized medicine. And I think what we would want to jump into now is talking about, as you mentioned, cell therapies and gene therapies. So listeners may have heard of something called CAR-T. CAR-T has been very successfully used for cancer treatment. It's an acronym which stands for chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy. And as one example of a cell therapy, it's personalized using either a donor or the patient's own blood. And there are also gene therapies. So Scott, you want to pick it up from there? Sure. Yeah. And speaking to this point, about 10 years ago, I was at a supply chain conference and the executive vice president of quality operations for Shire was there. And he gave this very compelling speech about how supply chain, as we understand it, is will be no longer in 10 years from now. And instead, it's going to look a lot more like a, a disc that's going to be placed into a personalized therapeutic pump that's attached to your body somehow. And that you'll be able to get small micro doses directly into your bloodstream very often rather than through your GI tract. And it's generally more efficient delivery. It's generally a safer delivery because you can target those direct values and all the pharmacokinetics and, and pharmacodynamics can be much more closely titrated to how your blood and your body works. And, and here we are eight years, roughly, since that conference. That was 2014-15. We're almost nine years in. And that's exactly where we sit about a few years further away from truly a, a personalized medicine that speaks exactly to it. But when we talk about that, a, a good example of this that's present and alive all around us is what Dexcom has been doing for a number of years, right? We talk about personalized medicine. Insulin delivery has become extremely personal. It used to be broad-based. It used to be required you to do separate measurements of your blood sugars, essentially, and then titrating a dose based on that. Now, with what Dexcom and a number of other major digital therapeutics folks have uh, created, you have the ability now to measure and then have a installed pump that basically just accomplishes everything that your pancreas used to do in real time. And so that change has been massive and fairly quick. And that's a really good indicator of what's coming. In the interim, what you have is what Ben described with cell and gene therapies, where you have what are called autologous cell infusion processes, where the patient's plasma is extracted, the cells are drawn, send it, sent to a manufacturing facility, and then the proprietary drug, peptide, whatever the proprietary agent is that's there to help with, for instance, immunotherapy or uh, other. It's very common, frankly, within the cancer treatment life cycle to include a cell or gene therapy that's an immune therapy. Primarily, those are cell therapies. 
gene therapies are more complex simply because you're essentially going in and editing the gene. If you've heard of the term CRISPR, which gets thrown around quite a bit on the business news, big companies like Vertex have been big in the CRISPR space. And that CRISPR acronym essentially defines the process to go in and physically change how genes perform, how they work. There's a lot of emergent work in, for instance, sickle cell, where gene therapies are being applied on a much broader basis. And the unique aspect of a gene therapy is that generally it's a permanent change and not a treatment. Generally, so when you talk about real healthcare change, if it works, you're no longer on a medication for the rest of your life, you've received a final change and the therapeutic advancement. That's a sea change from just about every other therapeutic area that we've experienced. And as in that same line, so recognizing that's an emergent space, there's also much more personalized medicine that's coming. The, great, the best example of that then we were talking about is Ujari, Ozempic, and Wagobi, which are some of the weight loss treatments. So you want to talk a little bit about kind of what you learned there? Yeah, yeah. Those, those are definitely future forward treatments. The listeners may have heard about a lot of these recently on the news, but a lot of them fall under a class of medications called GLP-1 drugs. And essentially, they work on the treatment of diabetes. And it was also found during the clinical trials, they do quite an exceptional job with treating obesity. And they work on insulin production. And essentially, the, the short story is that it looks like people lose about 15 up to 24, 25% of their body weight when they're treated with this class of drugs. Currently existing examples are Wagovi, Ozempic, Rebelsis, and Munjaro, as you mentioned. And uh, the, these are working in such a way that they're really helping people to not only manage their hemoglobin A1C levels, but like I said, in better managing or better blood sugar control, they are really helping people to shed tremendous amounts of weight. And so there was recently a poll out and uh, I'm not sure who ran the poll. I would have to look that up, but it was uh, suggesting that Americans would be keen to pay up to $100 a month just to manage their weight with a drug like this. And some people said that they would pay $250 per month or more. This is one of those cases of a, now a drug exists that's showing such promise for treating diabetes, also being able to then treat obesity that the market is there and seeking it out. But I guess the flip side is we always need to look at the benefit versus the risks. And I think this class of drugs has proven itself to be very safe, but we always want to make sure we're keeping an eye on what are the long-term risks, which we've got years worth of clinical trial data and certainly quite a bit of surveillance data from the public. So these therapies now are out in the wild. So people have been using them. And also, I guess I would say that it's not a one and done. If you don't have diabetes and you're taking something like this for obesity, you might find yourself in the situation where you've had radical weight loss. And then in three months, six months, you say, wow, I've achieved my target weight and maybe even more. And I think I'm going to stop taking this. I'm going to go off this drug. And the problem becomes, we've seen that people are essentially regaining all that weight. It's one of those, there, there aren't any shortcuts in mother nature's eyes. And unless you're making lifestyle changes, diet and exercise kind of thing, though these work exceedingly well, it's something that you'd have to be on for the long term if it was for obesity. Otherwise, if you're not making the lifestyle changes, you'll see the weight come back on. But I guess point being, if we've got some of these new drugs, which can control something as pernicious as diabetes and also obesity and all the chronic diseases that come with obesity, we certainly stand to gain incredibly as far as broad healthcare benefits for society. And I guess the capstone, if we have a minute or two, Tom, to, to that is recognizing that one of the changes to your question from our last episode about post-COVID, one of the changes that's happened is a couple different additions, 
you will, ameliorations of the existing programs around regulatory approvals. And those pathways have been cleaned up quite a bit. And frankly, the expectations and standards have been shifted. Again, when you can do a nine month full vaccine study, global vaccine study, it starts to create questions in the minds of drug developers, therapeutic developers, that there, there may be a simpler, cleaner way to get about this. And you're seeing a lot of change there where the pathways towards device approval, diagnostics approval have been cleaned up extensively in the last few years with a number of options. And in addition, expanded access programs, which really began to be accepted through a lot of advocacy driven change, especially around rare disease patients, pediatric rare disease patients in particular, but late stage oncology patients. The ability to access programs in the time between when a clinical research study ends and the drug is formally approved can be up to 12 to 24 months very often. And a number of advocacy groups have successfully lobbied to get access to a number of treatments for things like MS in the rare disease space, as well as a lot of pediatric diseases where a patient has been successfully managed according to standard of care now in that clinical study. And then the threat was there to have to abandon that treatment until it became formally approved 12 to 24 months later, which could have been significantly fatal, at least deeply challenging to their lifestyle and healthcare, overall healthcare. Those changes are in place as well. See those as broadly good, as Ben has mentioned, but needing to be aware that there is a risk benefit to all of this, which in our next session, as we talk about risk benefit utility curve, and Ben takes out that delicious magic marker of his, we can start to understand a little bit more about how to see behind the curtain here in relation to our healthcare. Well, gentlemen, that seems like a great place to end this episode. Before we leave, I wanted to ask you if our listeners wanted more information on yourselves or engage with you guys on any of the topics we've touched on in this podcast. What would be the best way for them to do, Scott? LinkedIn, Scott. A. Ben? Yep, LinkedIn works great. Google search, Twitter. Gents, thanks, and I hope our listeners will join us for our next episode.